So in 2005, I was 12 years old. At that point, I'd already been playing piano for many years, but I was starting to get really into music. I spent a lot of time raiding my dad's CD collection and trying to find albums that I liked. And a lot of the stuff I liked featured guitar. I knew my dad had an old guitar that he'd buried away in his closet. Every once in a while, he would take it out and plunk around on it a little bit. But for the most part, it was just gathering dust. So one day I approached him and I asked him if I could borrow his guitar and try to learn how to play. He graciously complied. So I quickly grabbed it and bolted up to my room, popped it out of the case and started messing around with it and trying to figure some things out. About 10 minutes later, I emerged from the haze and this is what I had learned. <laughs> The question is, why? Of all songs, why this one? Yeah, I was a rock music fan at this point. I'd known who Deep Purple was and I was familiar with the song, but why was that the one that I gravitated to? Why does that seem to be the song that so many beginning guitar players gravitate to? Let's find out. So today we're going to be talking about the song Smoke on the Water by Deep Purple. Deep Purple is an English rock band from London that formed in 1967. They were hugely popular in the early 70s. In their heyday, and at the time that Smoke on the Water was written and recorded, the band consisted of Ian Gillen on vocals, Richie Blackmore on guitar, John Lord on keyboards and organs, Ian Pace on drums, and Roger Glover on bass. The song we'll be discussing today, Smoke on the Water, was released on the Machine Head album on March 30th, 1972. For whatever reason, it's widely considered to be one of the most iconic songs in modern music history. A little weird tidbit that will showcase just exactly how influential it is, is that it's been the subject of multiple, not just one, but multiple world records for largest guitar ensemble. Thousands of people gathering to all play it at the same same time. Most recently, in May of 2009, Steve Morse, who was the guitarist in Deep Purple at the time, helped gather over 6,000 people in Poland to all play the song together. That's an absurd statistic to even contemplate. I'm happy if I get 6,000 views on the video. In 2017, the song was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame, and many, many rock music publications have listed it as one of the most influential guitar songs of all time. At face value, when you look at the lyrics of the song, it's kind of confusing. You have to know a little bit of the backstory to fully understand what's going on. So the story is, in 1971, Deep Purple had gathered in Montreux, Switzerland to record their album Machine Head. They'd rented this mobile recording truck from the Rolling Stones, and they were doing a lot of their recording at the entertainment complex of the Montreux Casino. While they were there, legendary musician Frank Zappa came to town to perform at the venue at the casino. During this performance, an audience member pulled out a flare gun and shot it at the ceiling, igniting the whole building on fire and burning the whole place down. Mid-concert, imagine being on stage or in the audience and witnessing this. So, with their recording location being burned down, Deep Purple suddenly had nowhere left to record their album. With the help of some of the casino staff, they were able to relocate to an empty hotel nearby where they recorded most of the rest of the album. The lyrics of Smoke on the Wall Water just, in a very straightforward way, chronicle the events of this incident. We all came out to Montreux on the Lake Geneva shoreline. Frank Zappa and the Mothers were at the best place around, but some stupid with a flare gun burned the place to the ground. Side note, they actually found the stupid with the flare gun. It's this guy. Also, as long as we're on the tangent here, did you know that Frank Zappa's kids are named Ahmet, Moon Unit, Dweezil, and Diva Muffin? I believe that he unofficially, up until Elon Musk, held the world record for most interesting children's names. But yeah, interesting guy. Maybe we'll cover Frank Zappa in another video. Okay, this is yet another tangent, but here's something else that's crazy and needs to be shared. So, Deep Purple never originally released a music video for Smoke on the Water. It wasn't until last month, March of 2024, that they actually put out a music video. It's a really cool video, it's half animated footage, half old concert footage, but the video was created around a remixed version of the song done by none other than Frank Zappa's son, Dweezil Zappa. The rabbit hole just always goes deeper. Okay, back to Deep Purple. So with the song being about a very specific event that took place at a very specific place, a lot of the lyrics are very subtle references to events or people that were relevant to the story. For example, in the second verse they have a line that goes, Funky Claude was running in and out. He was pulling kids out the ground now. This is a reference to Claude Nobbs, the founder of the Montreux Jazz Festival, who is an employee of the casino. Claude actually plays a pretty big part in the whole story, outside of helping rescue kids from the fire. He also helped Deep Purple find their new recording space, and in fact the entire Machine Head album is dedicated to him as a result. You've also got the line, the rolling truck stones thing right outside, which I think is hilarious. It's so casual and colloquial, but it refers to the mobile unit that they rented from the Rolling Stone. The rolling truck stones thing. It's expressed the way that a, an excited, confused friend might 
explain it as they're telling you the story. So these are examples of specific details that you might not fully understand at first listen, but even if you don't understand the meaning behind them, they're unique enough and interesting enough to be part of the fabric of what makes the song so memorable. You might not know who Funky Claude is, but you're gonna remember Funky Claude. So the lyrics are just very straightforward. It's like a friend telling you a story. But the fascinating thing for me about this song is the fact that Deep Purple was able to take this event that happened to them while they were recording their album and turn it into a song that appeared on that album. The band, after being ousted from their recording space due to some stupid with a flare gun, were like, all right, well, I guess if this is gonna happen, let's at least squeeze a legendary song out of it. It's just a very cool way to turn an unbelievably stressful situation into something that was an overwhelming positive for them in the long run. And even at the end of the song, you have some very self-aware meta lyrics about the whole thing. At the end of the third verse, they say, No matter what we get out of this, I know we'll never forget. Acknowledging the fact that they might get something out of this. It's the song referencing itself. And of course, as long as we're talking about the lyrics, we have to talk about the title, Smoke on the Water. The chorus lyrics lyrics are smoke on the water, a fire in the sky, smoke on the water. Super simple, but also very evocative. You can clearly picture what they must have been seeing in the aftermath of the fire. This line was written by the bassist Roger Glover after he had a very vivid nightmare about the incident a few days after it happened. So let's talk about the production, the instrumentation, the more musical aspects of the songwriting. As previously mentioned, the guitar riff is iconic, and it's one of the first things, if not the first thing, that most guitarists learn when they're picking up a guitar for the first time. And it's hard to say exactly why, but perhaps it's because of where the inspiration behind the riff came from. Richie Blackmore, the guitarist from Deep Purple who came up with the riff, has said that he took Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and just inverted it and flipped it around. In fact, in a 2007 interview, Blackmore actually said, I owe Beethoven a lot of money. Now he chopped it up and mixed it up enough that you can't really tell where it came from. Here's Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. <laughs> Here's the main riff from Smoke on the Water. But perhaps the riff being inspired by a classical piece that has stayed in the zeitgeist for hundreds of years, and the fact that it contains elements of that piece is what makes it so memorable and catchy. In the recording, Deep Purple also makes sure you know that it's an iconic riff by playing it for 51 seconds straight. In modern music, that's an insanely long intro. You'd almost never hear anything released today with the goal of getting airplay that had an intro that long. But in the classic rock era, this wasn't that uncommon. Deep Purple is also a band that had their roots in progressive rock, which is known for super long and theatrical and intricate songs, and being a little less radio friendly as a result. But you've got 51 seconds of that riff playing on repeat while the instrumentation just builds behind it. When it starts, it's just guitar and a hi-hat pedal, then a little more fall hi hi-hat starts to come in. Then you get a snare drum. Then the bass comes in. And before you know it, you're at verse one, and all of a sudden it feels like a rock song. In the verse, the instrumentation is more or less what you'd expect from a rock song. Electric guitar, bass, drums, but you've also got John Lord playing a Hammond organ. And this is something that helps define Deep Purple's sound. It gives it more of kind of a bluesy, earthy feel than a lot of hard rock stuff from that time. The song is slow, it's churning, it's punchy. It's got a lot of energy and momentum, but it's nothing too frenetic and crazy. Either. During the verse, there's almost no chord progression. Everybody just sits on the minor 6 chord, and then there's a brief moment where they slide to the 5 chord before immediately going back to the 6. <laughs> Now after the verse, they get to the chorus, and there's a couple things about the chorus that are really fascinating. First of all, the progression. The entire first half of the progression is chords from outside the key. So in a normal diatonic key, you might have the minor 2 chord, which sounds like this. But they instead use the major 2 chord, which sounds like this. Immediately after that, they go to the flat 7 major chord. One of my favorite chords to use in any progression, but technically from outside the diatonic key. And that sounds like this. They conclude by going back to the minor 6 chord, home bass for two bars before repeating the major two and the flat seven. So it's kind of fascinating. Some non-standard chords paying homage to their classical and prog rock influence background, but yet somehow still super catchy and, and with a lot of mass appeal. The other interesting thing about the chorus is it's only six bars long. It goes smoke on the water, a fire in the sky. That's a standard four bar phrase. After that, they go smoke on the water, but instead of repeating a fire in the sky or adding some other line there, they go right back to the main riff. <laughs> 
Yeah. Most of the time in contemporary Western music, sections of a song will be 4, 8, 16 bars. Not always, but most of the time. So it's interesting that they chose to deviate from that and make the chorus 6 bars long, cut it off early, and go right back to the iconic riff. <laughs> It's almost as if they know that the riff is the thing a lot of people are there for. And they want to make sure they spend as much time giving that to the audience as possible. And after that, they go verse 2, chorus 2. Mostly the same here. Instrumentation doesn't really change. The only thing that's really different is, of course, the lyrics, because we're telling a new part of the story. But also, John Lord is just going ham on that Hammond organ. He's doing all sorts of, like, blues licks and stuff in the background. It's really fun. After chorus two, they briefly go back to the main riff, and then the guitar solo comes in. Now, it's that main riff that makes the song iconic, but the guitar solo is also a classic piece of classic rock history. Richie Blackmore just plays over that main churning backdrop that we've had in the verses, and then slowly builds in crescendos until you get this very quick chord switch, where you go to the major two, then the major five, and he's really just wailing at that point. <laughs> And then the song returns to the main iconic riff, and Blackmore solos a little bit more over that to bring things down and settle them before verse 3. Verse 3 tells the conclusion of the story. Ian Gillen's having some fun with the vocals here. He's got a little more grit in his voice, and he's doing some fun things. He throws an ah -ha, and also does this really fun, quick falsetto run. Forgive me for that. But the point is he's having more fun and being more playful with the vocal line. And how does the song end? Of course we have to go back to that main classic riff. <laughs> However, after 16 bars of that, the musicians start to just go a little bit crazier with it. The drums go into double time. Everybody just starts improvising, soloing, making it more chaotic and frenetic, almost emulating a fire. The song then just fades out as they're getting crazier and bringing more life and energy to what they're doing. Which, funnily enough, after five and a half minutes of song, you're kind of left wanting more. The other thing I want to touch on with this song is the vocal melody, because it's kind of fascinating what happens here as well. During the verses, while the chords just kind of sit stagnant, Ian Gillen is just singing the pentatonic scale. We all came out to march us on the way to the shoreline. But in the chorus, to follow that weird chord progression, on the word smoke, he goes up outside of the diatonic key to the sharp four. And then on the wa of water, he brings that down to a regular four. Smoke on the water. Again, it's kind of unconventional, but it works really well. It's super catchy. So there you go. There's smoke on the water in a nutshell. What do you think? Does this make your list of iconic rock songs? If you're a guitarist, was it the first song you've ever learned? Have you ever even learned it? Let me know in the comments below, and also let me know what other songs I should break down. If you haven't already, please, please, please hit that big red subscribe button down below. Your support goes a long way and is greatly appreciated. And with that, I'll see you in the next one. Peace.